So I will, will um, uh, Bren will put it up on our Facebook page and um, on our uh, web page, hopefully, once we get that back. And I'm not quite sure how long Zoom takes. I don't think it's um, hardly any time at all. And uh, there you go. Yeah, you've got students showing up from College of Idaho. Awesome. Professor Walser, you did a great job with that. So again, if everybody can um, open the chat, type in your name and your affiliation, uh, that would be great. Okay, Adam, keep a watch on that waiting room. Oh, here comes Rob Tiedemann, one of our speakers today. All right, I'm going to um, continue. You guys can continue to say hi to everybody on the chat and um, talk back and forth to each other, either privately or publicly. Hi, Kyle Mack. And and hi, Tom Dupuis, Michael Stevenson, awesome, Idaho Power. Hi, Amanda. It's nice to know everybody's there at the other end of the line. I'm going to put up a poll, which I hope works. Um, I'm going to stop the sharing on the screen and put up the poll poll, see if we can get, um, so you sh hopefully the poll will show up on your screen and there's uh, three different questions. It's, it's just launching now. And you should be able to see the poll now and be able to log in your answers. Good, it looks like it's working. We're getting some replies. Thank you for doing that. That's great. I'll be able to share the um, I'll be able to share the results once they all come in. Again, I'm Liz Paul. I'm the coordinator with the Boise River Enhancement Network. We're gonna have a great program today to learn about paraphyton and um, water quality trends in the Boise River with Tyler King with the US Geological Survey, who I hope is in the meeting, because he's kind of an important guy in the meeting. chat is blocking the screen okay that's um uh try to pull the windows around um and you can put it in um uh speaker view and steve i see you steve and you can turn off your audio your video by just clicking on the little video button I'll do it for you. There you go. You stopped your video. All right. I am going to end in the polling. Uh, Adam, keep watching the uh, waiting room, please. Oh, this, you have to be able to rub your stomach and scratch your head at the same time when you're doing this. So the polling has ended. Sorry if you missed your chance to answer all three questions. Uh, and I will share the results now. Okay. So we have, um, it looks like 70% of you thought that the water quality was improving. 30% think it's getting worse. You'll know more in a little while. Uh, we have a majority of people who have not come to one of our brown bag lunch programs before. Welcome to all of you. 
And where did everybody hear about this meeting, this program today? Um, well, a lot from a brand email, so that's really awesome. Hi, Julia Page. We're gonna, that's right, excellent. Thank you for turning off your uh, uh, video there. Um, a teacher, yes, we have students. Welcome students from College of Idaho. Really glad you could join us. Um, we have three co-sponsors today um, uh, with AWRA and the Lower Boise Watershed Council and USGS. So they also helped um, get people here today. So that's awesome. I'm gonna stop sharing those results and uh, take a breather here to see if people are having problems um, being able to see what's going gone. Oh, Rebecca Flock is helping people, and so is Adam, helping people um, answer the, some of the questions about uh, making sure that you have good, um, you can see what's going on. Hi, Tom Dupuy, I already say hi to you, excellent. Hi, Michael Stauffer, glad to see everybody here. Oh, good, our speaker has come. So let me get Tyler all uh, set up. And, um, and then we are gonna start the show here in just a second. Let's welcome everybody. Continue to um, check in and talk on the, um, or using the chat. Uh, Tyler, I'm going to make you a co-host now so that you can uh, share your presentation here in just a few minutes. Great, thank you. Excellent. Hi, Tyler. Great. You can just uh, be there uh, with your, uh, uh, your audio on. That's fine. Everybody else, we're asking you to keep your audio and your video off. Um, Hi, Jessup Dennis from Xylem. I hope you guys are doing well and I know you're providing great water services in this time of coronavirus. Okay, um, let me get my uh, screen back up again so we can get ready to do our um, program. All right, so you should now be able to see uh, the screen that I'm sharing. And if you just have it on um, speaker view, then you can still see me. Hi, everybody. I'm Liz Paul. I'm the coordinator for the Boise River Enhancement Network. Thank you so much for being here. We have 75 people on, so that's super awesome. And um, you'll be glad that you're spending this time with us today. And um, we are asking everybody to keep their audio and their video off. Um, so it's more of a one-way communication. We will um, take questions through the, through the chat. And if you haven't found where the chat is, you go to the three little dots that say more on your control panel, then the top thing is chat. And you can open and close your chat box. So you probably wanna, uh, if it's obscuring your view, you might wanna close your chat while you're, um, while, while the, uh, while Tyler and everybody else is speaking. Um, and uh, we're really glad that everybody's here and we um, are uh, trying to continue with some of our ongoing, our, our regular educational things online like this. So this is, this is super awesome. Um, and we do have three, Three co-sponsors, okay, so now I'm trying to hear my screen actually moves. Uh, 
which it's not. So just here we go. We have three. We have three co-sponsors today. Um, a U.S. Geological Survey here in Idaho, the Idaho chapter of the American Water Resources Association and the Lower Boise Watershed Council. And um, Ashley, uh, it's all yours to do a little welcome from the Watershed Council. Ashley Newbury. Ashley, are you there? She's there somewhere. Okay, Ashley, we're going to go on. We're going to let, let you give you a couple minutes here. And um, we're going to go to uh, Mike Schubert here. Oops, 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 oops. There we go. Mike Schubert. Let's yep. see. Can we hear you speak? Yep. Can you hear me? Great. Thank you, Liz. Um, again, yes. my, name is, my name is Mike Schubert. I'm a water resources engineer with HDR and the president of the Idaho section of the American Water Resources Association. Uh, American Water Resources Association, or AWRA, is dedicated to the advancement of water resources management, research, and education. Our members represent a community of water resources professionals with diverse backgrounds, sharing Hello. an engagement in solving some of the toughest water resources challenges. Um, so the Idaho section of the AWRA has, uh, over the last several years, has had a very successful Bring Your Own Lunch and Learn program. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus has uh, challenged us a little bit and we're currently in the process of transitioning, uh, uh, similar, similar in the way that, uh, that Bren is transitioning to digital content, uh, transitioning our Lunch and Learns uh, to uh, digital format as well. Um, we are planning uh, upcoming uh, presentations or webinars uh, regarding eDNA, uh, water management from the ground up, uh, emerging contaminants and the Treasure Valley groundwater model. If you'd like to learn more about uh, Idaho section of the American Water Resources Association, uh, please visit our website at awraidaho.org. You can find um, information on uh, not only our events, but other uh, water management uh, related events in the state on the website. Um, you can also find information about joining our organization and membership um, if you'd like to get involved or if you'd like to present, uh, you can email uh, us at idawra.gmail. Uh, uh, at gmail.com. Th thank you, Liz. Thank you very much. Hey, You're Liz. welcome. Um, so, is that you, Ashley? It is. Yes. Okay, let me get, um, get your screen back up there for uh, the Watershed Council. There you go. Thank you Sorry. for being here. Uh, I guess there were some technical difficulties. Okay, so if you can hear me, um, my name is Ashley and uh, I work for the City of Caldwell and I presently serve as the Vice Chair on the Lower Boise Watershed Council. Uh, the Lower Boise Watershed Council is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that's dedicated to addressing water quality issues within the Lower Boise water, River watershed. If you'd like to know more, take a look at our website. It's lowerboisewatershedcouncil.org. Um, the council works to address and improve water quality issues within the watershed and the water quality improvements focus on restoring or maintaining beneficial river uses such as fish habitat and recreation. Certain reaches of the main stem Lower Boise River and some tributaries are impaired by pollutants. And by figuring out exactly where the problems are, we can figure out the most effective solutions. One way that we do that is by means of our partnership with the USGS to gather data on the Boise River. Thank 
you, Ashley. Really appreciate Thanks. that. Um, again, if people are having difficulties with um, with anything, put it in the chat, and Adam is um, monitoring the chat, and we'll we'll try to make sure we uh, can answer your questions and get help. We're trying we're, we're trying to help everybody get used to this virtual technology. Uh, this is Liz Paul with um, the Boise River Enhancement Network. Okay, Robin. Um, can you mute yourself or have you unmuted yourself? Uh, let's see if I can find you on here. Um, hi, Liz. Hi, Phil Bandy. Um, you there, Rob? I am here. Excellent. It's all yours. Thank you. Rob Tiedemann, I serve on the executive committee of the Boise River Enhancement Network. Thank you all for being here. I am wowed by the idea of 80 participants being on this video chat. Thank you all. We spend a great deal of time thinking about the megafauna that grow along the Boise River, and I'm in particular talking about some of the charismatic species like rainbow trout, great blue heron, and bald eagle. And we spend less time thinking about some of the smaller organisms that grow in the river, and along its flanks. And that's what Tyler King is here to tell us about. They're no less important, though they may be smaller in size. They are no less important than some of the charismatic species that grab our attention. I've seen Tyler speak before, and I think you're in for a treat. Tyler is a hydrologist with the US Geologic Survey at the Idaho Water Service Science Center. He has a PhD from Utah State University at the Science Center. He leads the Lower Boise Water Quality Project, working in close collaboration with the Idaho Department of Water, Water Quality and the Lower Boise Watershed Council to collect data necessary to track trends in water quality in the Lower Boise River. Tyler, it's all yours. Thank you. Okay, Tyler, I am going to stop sharing, and um, you should be able to now share your screen. Okay, I am working we'll on it. We'll give you a minute to get share. that set up. Okay, you should now be seeing my screen, I believe. You should be seeing the, uh, the type slide. Everything yes. Works? Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Liz, and thank you to everyone for uh, joining us today. Uh, my name is Tyler King. I am a hydrologist uh, with the uh, U.S. Geological Survey Boise, based here in, uh, I'm based here in Boise. Uh, and we're going to be talking today about uh, Periphyton 101 in the Lower Boise River. Um, an outline for today's talk um, is that we're first going to dive into an overview of the Lower Boise River and its watershed. We're going to talk about some water quality trends that we're seeing in the Lower Boise River, and then we're going to jump into periphyton. What is it? Why do we, why do we care? And, and what can it tell us? Uh, and then we're going to talk about periphyton observations in the Lower Boise River, and then we'll have a wrap-up, and if we have time, uh, there'll be a Q&A session. So as we go, uh, if you have questions, uh, put them in the, in, in the chat, as Liz mentioned, uh, and, and we'll get to them at the end. Okay. So the Lower Boise River and its watershed. It drains, um, uh, well, it, the Lower Boise River, the section that we're talking about is 64 miles long. It goes from uh, Lucky Peak Reservoir on the right uh, down to the Snake River uh, on the left. Um, and the watershed itself drains nearly 1,300 square miles. And as of 2006, which is a bit dated, but the numbers still generally hold, uh, the watershed was made up almost half of what's called rangeland, about a third agriculture, about 16% developed and 1% forest. Uh, in this map here, you see the developed areas uh, shown as yellow and all the other land use categories as tan. The population in this watershed is somewhere in the order of 700,000 people, um, and as we know, growing every day. So it's an important watershed because it serves many people. Uh, and there's a lot of agricultural activity. Now, this watershed, this portion of the watershed at least, the Lower Boise, uh, we also know to be uh, impacted by human activity, right? And so the first thing that we're gonna look at uh, in water quality is, is the amount of water or the flow, the discharge, and how that varies over space and time. 
So we're going to take a look at flows uh, up above the reservoirs in kind of a natural system. Uh, and then we're going to look at flows just downstream of Lucky Peak Dam and then all the way out at the mouth at the end of the river, okay? So to begin with, we're going to look at Twin Springs, um, Idaho, which is up above uh, the uh, Arrow Rock Reservoir. And what I'm showing here is a hydrograph. So on the vertical scale, you have flow in cubic feet per second. And then going across from left to right, we have one calendar year from January through December. It's a busy plot, so we're going to talk you through it. The, the green band is what's considered a normal range of flow, and that's based on over 100 years of stream flow record at this gauge. This, this gauge is what we call a century gauge at the U.S. Geological Survey. It's, you know, been operating for over 100 years. So the green is normal, the blue colors are above normal, and the tan and brown are below normal, okay? So if you really focus in on that green band, you see that in the Beginning at the beginning of the year, we have relatively low flows. Then as the snowpack starts to melt, those flows rise and come to a peak sometime in uh, May or June and then fall back off again uh, by August and September, uh, you know, a fairly dry portion of the year for us. And then the precipitation picks back up again in the winter as snow mostly. And then, you know, the cycle repeats itself year after year. The black line, the dark black line there is what, where we are so far this year. So as you can see in the natural system, we're, we're, we're within the normal range. Okay, so that's a natural portion of the watershed. As we move downstream, just below the reservoir, the hydrograph starts to look a bit different, right? So here again, we have discharge on the, in the vertical, and here this is across one calendar year. Now, based on 65 years of record, what we see, the most striking aspect, is that the flows rise in May and they stay elevated until, you know, early, mid-October when they come back down again. And we're seeing that by looking at this green band, the bright green band. Those are the normal flows, right? And so this is done for multiple reasons. One is, you know, that we don't have a really sharp, high uh, discharge like you would upstream, and that's to prevent flooding. And it's also kept at, a, at an elevated flow throughout the summer, and that's to supply water for irrigation needs. Now, if we look all the way down at the mouth at Parma, the hydrograph gets a bit more messy. The green band, the normal, you know, has a much larger range now. Uh, the peak still happens sometime in May, but this is, you know, a, a more complicated uh, signal to try to, to try to pick out. So the message here is, you know, it's, it's a complicated um, a complicated portion of the watershed where we have, uh, you know, the, the impacts of all of our irrigation water go, coming out and going out and coming back to the river. Okay. So we know that flows are altered and they're altered to prevent flooding and to support our water use needs. And we can see that if you just compare these three hydrographs from top to bottom, right? Now, the, the beneficial uses for water in our watershed, like what we're trying to use the water for, can be ca categorized into four basic classifications. The first is domestic and agricultural water supply, right? So that's, that's why we end up with this high, high elevated flow at, uh, coming out of Lucky Peak over the summer to support that demand. But we also have a requirement uh, for primary and secondary contact recreation. Those are things like uh, swimming uh, and boating. Additionally, <clears throat> cold water aquatic life has been identified as a designated beneficial use for the water. So we need to, make, do we need to maintain uh, suitable conditions to grow aquatic life. And then additionally, uh, salmonid spawning is, is a beneficial use for water within our watershed. And so it, I think it really helps to take a look at the plumbing of the system to understand how we end up with such strong variation in the hydrographs from a natural signal upstream to what we see downstream. This plot is super busy, but the, the main point here um, is that you can divide the watershed basically into two parts. So here's Lucky Peak Reservoir, so at six, mile 64, uh, coming down to Middleton here. And what we see there is that for the most part, uh, we have water leaving the river, right? So there are 15 diversions or 15 outs and only six inputs to the system as, uh, you know, concentrated uh, surface water runoff in streams or, or uh, regulated discharge points. And then as you move downstream from Middleton down to the mouth, 
you see that there are, you know, there's still many withdrawals from the system, but there are also a whole bunch, there's also a whole bunch of water coming back in, right? So that's kind of the plumbing of the system, and that's how we end up with the complicated signal that we see down, downstream at Parma. It also has implications for water quality. Now, in terms of water quality, there are three major water quality metrics that we really care about and that have regulations put on them in the form of what's called a total maximum daily load. Okay? And that's just jargon for regulation. Okay? You're going to give it that way. So the first one is that that's, that's regulated is sediment. And too much sediment you know, is not good for aquatic life. It can smother out uh, photosynthetic organisms. It can embed the riverbed so that it's not good for some audit spawning. Uh, it can also make the water not clear. People don't want to recreate in it. Uh, secondly, there's bacteria. And, and in this case, we're speaking specifically about uh, E. coli or fecal coliforms. Um, and these have impacts on human health if, if uh, levels are, are elevated too high and people are exposed. And then the third is total phosphorus, and which can lead to nuisance algal growth. And that happens not only within the Lower Boise River itself, but also downstream in the Hell's Canyon complex. And so what we're trying to do by controlling total phosphorus is, is really control the growth of um, benthic plants uh, that produce chlorophyll A. And, the, and those are periphyton, which we're going to talk about quite a bit uh, in, just a little, in just a little while. So what are we seeing for water quality trends in the Lower Boise River? Well, first we're gonna look at suspended sediment. And this is another hydrograph. So stream flow is, is on the left side here. These numbers correspond with the blue line. And the numbers on the right correspond with the suspended sediment concentration, which are the little dots. And there are a couple of things to pick out. Um, the yellow dots are upstream at Eckert. The orange dots are kind of in the middle of the system at Middleton. And then the red dots are downstream at Parma. So generally what we see is that there's an increase in the amount of sediment in the water as we go downstream. This makes sense because you know all that water that, that left the river is coming back in in the form of drains and uh, stormwater runoff potentially is also a con contributor. And so we see that suspended sediment increases as we go downstream, okay? Also plotted on this is this red dashed line, and that's our target. We don't want to exceed that level. And so for the most part, we can see that the Boise River is, is meeting that goal. Another thing to note, lastly, is that suspended sediments tends to be highest in the summertime or during the irrigation season, and then it drops off um, as flows uh, come back down again. Okay. So the second water quality parameter that we're talking about was, was bacteria, or E. coli. Um, this is a plot uh, showing E. coli concentrations over time from Eckert, which is upstream, Middleton, and Parma. And the main takeaway here is just that um, water quality tends to get worse the farther you go downstream. This makes sense because we're integrating the signal that's coming from the landscape into the, in, into the river. Um, which in part brings in fecal coliforms. There's also an interesting trend within, within any given year. So this is, again, a plot of Eckert, Middleton, and Parma from left to right. Uh, we see that, you know, over the course of a year, these are numbered months. One is January, 12 is December. Um, it stays relatively low. There's the, the higher values tend to happen in the summertime but not always. And then if you look at Middleton, there does definitely seem to be an elevated period of the year that corresponds with, with the summer. And Parma is a bit more complicated as, well, as with what we saw in the flows. Still an elevated level sometime in early spring and through the summer, but it's not as clear of a signal. Okay, but again, the, point, the main point here is that water quality tends to decrease the farther downstream we go. We also talked about phosphorus, right? And this is a nutrient needed by plants and too much of it causes too much plant growth. And so here we look over space. So here we have on the left, we have phosphorus concentrations for Eckert. In the middle is for Middleton. And on the right is for Parma. And the red line is what we're trying to get to for concentration. That's 0 0.07 milligrams per liter, okay? And again, what we, the, the trend that we see is that water quality is better upstream and it, the water quality decreases or phosphorus concentration increases as we go downstream. 
And these plots are broken out to show the irrigation season or the summer in green and the non-irrigation in orange, but that nuance is, um, is, is more than what we have time to talk about today. But you can see that the trend holds for both, for both periods of the year. Now, that being said, there's been an awful lot of work done to try to control phosphorus in the system and huge investments by our cities with their wastewater renewal facilities and wastewater treatment plants and with 319 grants uh, going out and implementing best management practices on farms. There's been a lot of investment and I'm happy to share with you that that investment is paying, seems to be paying off. This is a plot now over, of phosphorus concentrations over time. Again, that red line is, uh, is what we're trying to get to. And I'm showing phosphorus concentrations for Parma right now, which is, you remember, the worst site uh, for phosphorus in the Lower Boise River in that it has the most phosphorus. Um, and what we can see is that there appears to be a downward trend in recent years. And if we add a smoothing, a series of smoothing lines, that trend becomes, uh, that, that trend becomes very apparent. And you see starting sometime around 2015, maybe as early as 2012, uh, at least statistically speaking, there is a decrease in, in, uh, in total phosphorus uh, at leaving the Boise River uh, at, at Parma. So this is a huge um, improvement. And if you believe in, statist in, in statistical regressions, one could argue that you know, we're looking to get to meeting the desired concentration uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, as long as we keep up with our uh, implementation of best management practices and continue to invest in our infrastructure that manages nutrients. So big kudos to everybody out there who's working on this. Um, this is a really, I'm, I'm really excited and, and happy to be able to share this sort of message with you today. Okay, so with that decrease in phosphorus, are we seeing a decrease in the amount of uh, benthic chlorophyll A or, you know, plants on the riverbed? So this plot shows chlorophyll A on the vertical in concentrations of milli milligrams per square meter. And the box plots go from upstream at Eckert to Parma, which is downstream. And we've broken it out into two periods, um, everything before 2017 or before 2018 and everything afterwards. And what you can generally see is that yes, the chlorophyll A is decreasing uh, in recent years. The numbers under each of those boxes represent the number of measurements, and it makes sense that there are fewer in recent times just because, you know, it's not as much time to integrate the signal. So there are some questions about whether or not it's statistically uh, robust enough to actually say that, yes, we are definitely seeing a decrease, but it's certainly pointing in the right direction, and we're also reaching uh, levels that are uh, within the target. Uh, so with more data collection, we'll be able to provide a more robust comparison between uh, different periods of time, uh, but things are looking really good uh, for, for benthic chlorophyll A. Okay, so one question is, what, what's the coordinate connection between nutrients and water quality, and why should we care how much nutrient, uh, what the nutrient concentration in the river is? So I found this great schematic from an author last name Paul in 2017 in an EP, a report to EPA, uh, where he really laid out, so, the, the, the pathways of how nutrients impact water quality that in ways that we care. So looking up here at the top portion, we have competition, right? Um, where let's say we increase nutrients. Now that could shift who in the community is making the most uh, of, of those nutrients. So we could see a, a shift in community composition, which could change the quality of food for the higher trophic level uh, species, things like fish, those megafauna that Rob was talking about. Um, it could also end up producing nuisance or harmful algal uh, or plant growth, which in turn could have impacts by producing toxins, affecting the aesthetics and also the taste and odor of water, which has impacts for you know, fish, recreation, and also for drinking water. So just shifting the community can have negative impacts or positive, depending on the direction of the shift. Also, if you increase nutrients, you could just ramp up the amount of primary productivity, and that, that, that's uh, photosynthesis, think of it that way. Well, by ramping up photosynthesis, you increase the amount of organic matter, which can have negative impacts, by you know, 
promoting the production of disinfection byproducts when that water comes in contact with a disinfectant, say in a drinking water treatment plant. Um, those disinfectant byproducts, you know, they're not good for humans. And so our drinking water treatment plants do a, a take a, do a really good job of monitoring for the organic matter to make sure that they're not produced at a level that's harmful. Increased organic matter can also increase respiration. And that, that's basically just if you have more plants growing, you have more plants dying, and their death and, and decomposition consume oxygen, which can have impacts on those higher trophic levels like fish, but also macroinvertebrates uh, and invertebrates, so like the, the bugs that live in, in the benthic community. This increased organic matter can also have impacts on the physical habitat and the clarity of the water, which you know, have impacts uh, on recreation. So this, this really, I, I think, makes a strong case for why should we, why should we why we should care about not just the nutrients, but also um, the, the community in the benthic environment. Okay, so Liz, we've got a quick poll here. Uh, if you could get that started. Um, these images, these eight images um, are taken from uh, up in Montana. Um, and they show different levels of benthic level A. And what I'd like folks to do would be to respond to that poll uh, that, that Liz, I believe, is starting, um, to select which of the water bodies would you be willing to recreate? So. The poll, the poll, this is Liz. The poll is launching and, all right, people, it looks like people are doing something, so you must be able to see it. That's great. Can you see Super. it, Tyler? I can see it. Yeah, I can see the responses. That's awesome. You can see it. Yep. Okay, good. Okay, and so you can move the poll to the side so you can see the poll and the slides at the same time if you didn't already figure that part out. Welcome Great. to everybody who's joined since um, we got started. Okay, so looks like we're at 45 people so far responding. That's that's give you another maybe 20 seconds um, and I'll just while, while that's going on I'll give a huge shout out to uh, the American Water Resources Association who published uh, the results uh, of a survey based on these pictures uh, back in 2009 in a landmark study subtly and other called how green is too green so huge shout out to American Water Resources Association for uh, publishing very relevant and valuable, uh, and valuable science. Okay. So I'm curious, Liz, if I put the results of the poll in front of on this screen, can everybody see this? I will, I'll close the poll and put up the results, okay? Okay, the poll is closed and it'll be just a sec and then I can, um, Nothing is working at um, rocket speed. Okay. And now I'll share the results. And everybody, including Tyler, will be able to see the results. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So it looks like about 75% of you said A and B would be good. Then there's a big drop off before we hit C. And then it gets tends to get smaller as we go down D through H. Well, that, that's great. This, this really indicates that you can uh, tell green from not green. Okay, so what, what does this actually mean, right? If you put this in context of chlorophyll A concentrations, here's what, here's what each picture corresponds to, all right? So we have 40 milligrams, people seemed to think was okay, 110 was okay. There was a drop around 150. We dropped down to about 40% of respondents said that that would be okay. Now we can compare these results with the results that were published from a much more scientific study that asked hundreds of people about those same pictures that you just saw. And we ended up, we ended up with very similar results to what they did um, where they saw a big drop off between C and D. In our study, we went from about 40 to about 20%. Um, and so that's a, that's, a, that's a pretty big drop as well. Um, so I'll point out that for the lower Boise River, our criteria is about 150, it is 150 milligrams per liter, 
which again corresponds to this picture here C. So that's that's what we're shooting for, okay? And and we're getting that and better um, at, at most locations in the river. Okay. But what makes up that chlorophyll A signal? Well, that's what we're all here for. This is where th this is this is made up of periphyton. Well, that probably doesn't help much because what is periphyton? Well, I think it helps to conjugate the word. So if you go back to your Latin, peri means around and phyton means to grow. And you know, in Latin conjugation, sometimes things are backwards. So periphyton means to grow around. Okay. And that doesn't necessarily help that much, but it gives us an idea. So a definition of periphyton is an assemblage of organisms, such as some algae, that live attached to underwater surfaces. Okay? That attached part is important because otherwise we'd be talking about all algae, including like floating algae, which are planktonic, which we're not talking about that here today. We're talking about the stuff that actually lives attached to the subsurface. And in the lower Boise River, our substrate tends to look a lot like this. A lot of cobbles, uh, gravel, some sand. Um, so if we dive in underwater there and pick up some sample, uh, this is what we're talking about here. Um, now, if you know your Latin and you, can, and you can read what's on the screen, you know that this is, we're talking about epilithic periphyton or periphyton that's growing on rocks. That's different from epidendric, epiphytic, or epipelic, which grow on different surfaces on, under the water. But today, because our substrate is made up mostly of cobbles, we're going to be talking about uh, the epilithic periphyton. So let's get up close and personal. Let's put our nose right up in there. Let our eyes focus a little bit. Okay, so a good question would be, who the heck lives here, right? What makes up this community? Well, it turns out there are basically four components in the Lower Boise River. We first off, we have diatoms, which are absolutely extraordinary creatures. And we have blue-green algae. Uh, picture is, is shown here. Um, we have yellow-green algae, which are far less common, but they, they do still exist. And then we have green algae. And the, the green algae are kind of like the, the big structures um, that, that we see that, uh, that, that are present in, in, in this photo. But jumping ahead a little bit, we, we don't have time to talk about each of those members of the community in detail, so we have to find a way to focus on specific ones. And so if, you look, if we look at just the number of individuals present in the Lower Boise River, uh, this, won't, this, this won't be a spoiler for the rest of the presentation necessarily, but it's made up mostly of diatoms and blue-green algae. So we're gonna focus on those two and say, you know, blue-green algae or green algae and yellow-green algae, it's been nice, but we're, we're gonna focus on these other two for, for, for a minute, okay? So blue-green algae, you probably also know it as, or you should know it as cyanobacteria. Algae is truly a misnomer in this case, it is, a, it is a type of bacteria, but you know, 100 year old classifications die hard, so it's still, the nomenclature is still blue-green algae. You've probably heard of them because they're related to harmful algal blooms. And the big three um, harmful algal taxa in our region are Anabina, Aphamazomenon, and Microcystis. And those, can be difficult to remember if, if this isn't your field. So instead, you can remember their monikers of Annie, Fanny, and Mike. Um, that I find helps helps me at least to, to remember uh, who we should be most concerned about in terms of blue-green algae for uh, harmful algal blooms. Now there are others, but those are the big three. And in general, those three are not found in the Lower Boise River periphyton community, with the caveat that there are a couple of other less problematic yet toxin producing species found. We'll talk about those later. Now, generally speaking, harmful algal blooms become an issue when you have exponential growth in the planktonic community, although there is some evidence that benthic algal blooms can be problematic. Um, but you, it really requires a, a situation where you have a dominant growth by a couple of uh, toxin producing species, which we'll find out later we don't actually have. Uh, we don't have the conditions to allow for one uh, taxa to take over. 
Blue green algae are absolutely fascinating. They're, they're among the oldest living organisms on the planet. They've been around for th about 3 billion years. When, when you consider that the earth is only 4.5 billion years old, they've been here an awful long time. So they've adapted their, their very simple uh, strategies for success and that has, that has served them well for you know, 3 billion years. And also it's interesting to note that blue green algae are thought to be responsible for giving rise to the atmosphere as we know it because before blue green algae were around there was an awful lot of methane in the atmosphere our planet probably looked more like a, a moon of Saturn or something like that but with blue green algae coming around and producing oxygen which broke down that methane it allowed the atmosphere to clear and to become the planet that we know that it, it, it to be today so these are keystone species um, not only that, but they look absolutely amazing. So this, this is a closer look of that, uh, at that picture of uh, blue-green algae or Dilicospermum. This is uh, a photo by Dr. Barry Rosen, who's retired USGS researcher. He's now at Florida Gulf Coast University. And you see that there are a variety of cells in here, the, like the dark green ones. Those are able to photosynthesize. And what's fascinating about this particular one is that there, you see that bright green orb there, and that's, a, that's called a heterocyte. And inside there are enzymes that allow this organism to take nitrogen out of the atmosphere, nitrogen gas, and fix it, convert it into organic nitrogen that can be used uh, by other plants and by this organism itself. This is a nitrogen fixing or organism and, and, and it keeps that, that nitrogenase separate from the rest of its cells because oxygen actually uh, destroys the nitrogenase. So it's developed this strategy to have these specialized cells that allow it to you know, perform multiple different functions, um, which is ab absolutely fascinating. Um, another picture um, that I just can't not show you, this one is of a, a taxa called Gliotrichia. Um, this was also taken by Dr. Barry Rosen, um, where he uh, used fluorescence to get to, to take an image of this, uh, th this individual, uh, showing the various pigments present that allow it to photosynthesize with, with different wavelengths of light. So absolutely beautiful creatures, if, if, no, if nothing else. Okay, so the amazing nature of blue-green algae is, uh, is outdone only by diatoms, in my opinion. Diatoms, these are, these are amazing. They're called living opals. And that, that's because, um, well, they're, they're single-celled algae, um, but their cell walls are made out of silica. You, you know what else silica is? It's in glass. So these, these diatoms, they live in shells of glass, which is, I, I mean, that, that in itself is absolutely amazing. Uh, but there's also a wide diversity of them. There are, the, estimates range, the estimates range from 20,000 different species to over 2 million different species of diatoms in the world. Uh, they're mostly photosynthetic, although there are, there are a couple of what are called obligate heterotrophs, which need food produced from someone else. They can't make their own uh, nutrients. Um, but the, the, those that are photosynthetic, they're responsible for, produce, for, for producing between 20 and 50% of the oxygen uh, that, that we breathe in our atmosphere um, on an annual basis. So absolutely, absolutely essential organisms. Um, they, they exist in the marine environment as well as the freshwater. Uh, they form the base of a uh, food chain. They're eaten by you know, uh, macroinvertebrates, by grazers, uh, by zooplankton. Um, and they're sensitive to water quality. So what types of diatoms grow where uh, is dependent on uh, the quality of the water that's present. And because their uh, shells are made out of silica, when they die and get buried, their, uh, their shells become fossilized and become part of what's called the paleo record. So if you take a, a core of sediment, you can look back to see what diatoms were present, you know, maybe thousands of years ago. And from that, you can derive estimates of what the qual water quality was like, you know, the temperature, the pH, uh, the amount of iron, things like that. So absolutely fascinating creatures. Um, Another thing I want to share with you is that they reproduce by mostly by division or mitosis. And when that happens, you know, you break two halves apart, but they're both, they both have really rigid silica shells. And so when you grow, go to grow back the missing half, it ends up growing back smaller. And you just imagine that happening time and time and time and time again. And over time, the cells get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And smaller, and smaller, and smaller. In a process of, uh, that's called diminution. So just think the you know, your parents were bigger than you, your kids are smaller than you, your grandkids are even smaller and great-grandkids, and 
and on and on and on. So until you get to a point where you know the 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 shell is just too small to can't contain all the biological mechanisms that are required to be packed in there. And so every so often, the when these individuals get small enough, they produce what are called oxospores. These kind of like loose bags that allow them to expand back up to their normal size um, and start the process all over again. Which I mean. That's that absolutely blew my mind when when I when I learned about that for the first time. Okay, the last thing that I'm going to share with you about diatoms is um, that when they die and they become part of the sediment, they produce a substance called diatomaceous earth. You may have heard of that because it's used uh, as for filtration. It's used, you know, for for swimming pools and fish tanks, but also in the production of beer and wine. So, you know, cheers cheers to diatoms for for uh, for the for the role that they play. Um, it's also used as an insecticide because the silica absorbs the oils from the waxy exoskeleton of pests and dehydrates them and, and leads them to uh, their, their bitter end. Um, and then lastly, diatomaceous earth is a key ingredient that, uh, that's used in dynamite to stabilize nitroglycerin. You may have heard of this guy, Alfred Nobel. Um, that, that was one of his major discoveries. So, I mean, diatoms are incredibly important uh, both in their living phase as well as in the you know, as as well as once they've died and become part of the geologic uh, become part of the geologic record. So, I mean, wow, these these creatures are absolutely amazing. Um, so they have like like I said, they have a wide diversity, and some of their shapes are absolutely mind blowing. So here's a schematic by uh, Zhang and and others where they. Uh, produce uh, three-dimensional models of what these things look like. And I mean, there's, it's insane. There's, there's cigar shapes. There's, I mean, I'm pretty sure that there's a model of Sputnik in there. There's the Death Stars present. There are end tables. I mean, so there's abs absolutely fascinating, uh, fascinating critters. Okay, so what do we have uh, within, within the Lower Boise River? So we go out and we sample uh, at five different locations in the Lower Boise River, and we try to and we and we measure who's present in that benthic community in the in the periphyte. So the sampling procedure looks something like this: first, we go out and uh, we find a spot, a riffle where um, where these where these uh, periphyte communities grow the strongest. Uh, we collect you know a sample, so something like this: green, icky, periphytic covered uh, rock. We put a, a scribe on top and we scrub out all of the growth within, the, within that area. And we do that repeatedly uh, for you know, a given site. So we end up with a, a representative measurement of, uh, of the paraphytic community. So that's what the process of data collection looks like. So the results. In the lower Boise River, there are over 200 algal species that have been identified. And that's represented here by this color wheel. And the green represent the diatom species, and the red are everything else, and the non-diatoms. So we can see first and foremost that there's huge diversity in the diatom community uh, pre present in the Lower Boise River. And that's probably a good thing. We want conditions that allow for a variety of species to thrive, not just, not just a few select ones. But this plot is terribly, terribly busy. But I just want to give you a flavor for some of the uh, the the, la the layer of detail that we can get out of our analyses. Okay, and this this forms sort of the basis of the simplified uh, trends that I'm going to point out to you um, in the next couple slides. Okay, so the first the first uh, result I want to share with you is what's called uh, species richness, or how many species are present at any given site on any given day. So these plots, these are six plots um, showing the richness or number of species uh, from upstream on the right is Eckert and to downstream on the left is Parma. And what kind of jumps out here is that it's fairly, you know, it doesn't change a whole lot. There's, you know, somewhere between 30 and 60 um, species present. On average, there are 46, which means that, that that's good. We have good diversity, uh, both across space as well as across time. Okay. Um, the next plot that I want to show you gets at uh, how many uh, how many individual cells are present um, across space. So this plot shows the density on the vertical axis, or the number of cells per square centimeter, 
uh, and we're going from Eckert on the right down to Parma on the left. And what you see here is that, you know, there's generally an increase as we go downstream towards Caldwell and then a drop off again in the number of, of cell, or the cell density. And that happens for both the diatoms, which are in gray, as well as the blue-green algae. And you can see now why we focused on those two so much. Green algae in terms of number of cells, not, not that important, okay? So we see this general trend uh, as we move downstream and then a drop off again at Parma. Now, if we look at these patterns over time now, this is for the, each bar is for the entire river, uh, we see some cyclical patterns showing up. Specifically, we can see that in, uh, in, at the end of the year, say in November, there's high density uh, in these communities. And then as we move through the summer, the density drops and then they pick back up again. And that is directly correlated with water quality. You may remember that the sediment was lowest in the fall and through the winter and highest in the summer, which is why we see this drop as we move from the winter into the summer. The habitat is just not as good in the summer to support, uh, to support uh, the paraphytic community because they depend so much on, uh, on photosynthesis. Okay, so that was the number of cells present, but we know that these cells vary a lot in size. So here I have plotted up the size on a per cell volume um, of these three different species. We have or three different, sorry, groupings. Blue-green algae, which are, tend to be smaller, and then diatoms, and then green algae. And this is on a log scale, which means every, every one of these tick marks is an increase of a fat by a factor of 10. So for some scale, let's assume that a human is about this size, right? Like right about the median value for diatoms. Let's say that that's a human. Um, if that were the case, then the small diatoms would be about the size of a mouse, and the smallest of the algae would be about the size of a fly, okay? Well, on the other end, we also have some behemoths. In here, we have something that would be, you know, relative to us, the size of killer whales or, or larger, right? So there's a huge diversity in the size of individual uh, diatoms and, uh, and, and algal cells. Now I'm just going to point out that this biggest cell up here for uh, blue for green algae is, uh, is a Cladophora uh, species up here. Okay, so we know that it's majority diatom and blue green algae uh, in in the Lower Boise River when we talk about numbers of cells, but when we look at the uh, the who makes up the most volume within the community, we get a bit of a different story. So here we're showing, again, a plot uh, from upstream on the right to downstream on the left. And now we see that there's this cladophora that tends to dominate uh, down at Parma. And there's a picture there on the left of showing what that, what that looks like. So by volume, it turns out that green algae actually make up a decent portion of the, uh, ben of the benthic community down at Parma. Um, at the other sites, by volume, uh, it's mostly dominated by diatoms, so still very important. Um, if we look at over time, we see a similar pattern emerge where we have higher values in the winter. Uh, again, this is Cladophora, so that really drives that signal. Um, lower across the summer, and then picks back up again in the fall as water quality improves, you know, water levels come down and sediment uh, decreases. So we can learn a little bit by talking about uh, the most common and the most rare species. So for blue-green algae, uh, there are two species that are found at every site. Um, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that because I have taught this mostly to myself through reading and not, so I, I don't actually know. Uh, but that second one, Formidium uh, autumnale, um, is, is worth mentioning because there is evidence that it does produce toxins. Okay. Um, then, then there are two species that, that we found only once, um, then those were both of the Homothrix uh, genus. And that tells us something because, you know, we, um, that, that indicates that there's, that there's a diversity of species, species out there. Now, when we go to look at diatoms, remember we talked about how they're sensitive to water quality. This figure here kind of illustrates that concept. 
where on the left side we have biological condition from good is high and bad is low on this scale. Uh, and that's plotted against the increasing effect of human activity. And the concept that they're pulling out in this paper on in 2016 is that there's some threshold at which you see a, a change, right? From say good biological condition to poor biological condition. And they actually compared that with total phosphorus, which is similar to what similar to the sort of questions that we're asking with this work. Um, so using their scale of um, diatoms that are sensitive, highly sensitive to highly tolerant, we can look at the top 10 co most common species of diatoms uh, in the paraphytic environment. And what we see is that eight of those 10 most common are tolerant or better. And that's not necessarily a good thing, um, it kind of gives us kind of like a C plus uh, grading for water quality because we don't have a whole lot of these uh, very sensitive or intermediately sensitive species that would, you know, indicate that we have better water quality uh, in the lower Boise River. So if we take a look at where do the tolerant species tend to dominate, we can look over space. So here on this plot, we have Eckerd on the right, the sort of clean water site down to Parma. And what we tend to see is that uh, these tolerant species tend to be found down, farther downstream uh, in places with what we think of as poorer water quality. So that makes sense. We're, what we're seeing in uh, the water, water quality measurements are verified by what we're seeing in, in the uh, biological community. Now this next one is super exciting and I, I am, I'm just absolutely floored by this. So, we can also ask a question of where are the sensitive species? Where do they live? So if we look just at highly sensitive species, this, you know, they, this is um, th this is one uh, Acnanothidium ribulare, um, and it it is found mostly up farther upstream where we have better water quality. And you know that shouldn't be terribly surprising. But what's what's really really cool is that while it's found throughout the, the Lower Boise River, it was only found farther downstream starting in August of last year. And this is huge. This means that the improvements that we're seeing in water quality could potentially be having uh, substantial and meaningful bio impacts to the biology of the system, which is exactly what we want to be seeing. So this is, uh, this is absolutely great news. Um, and, and, and I'm super excited about this. So as, as a wrap up, what have we learned? So we know that water quality is getting better in the lower Boise River, specifically with respect to phosphorus. And that's thanks to tireless efforts of many stakeholders who have been involved in, in, uh, in, in this process. Um, we know that we still have a little ways to go to meet the phosphorus target. Um, if you remember, we were shooting for, or we are shooting for 0 0.07 milligrams per liter of phosphorus, and we're a bit above that, but we're trending in the right direction. Okay, for periphyton, what did we learn? Well, it's, it's an assemblage of organisms. So periphyton is any organism that lives attached to surfaces uh, below the water. And in our case, it's made up mostly of uh, algae in the form of diatoms and, uh, and blue-green algae if we go by uh, cell density. In the lower Boise River, we have a near even split between diatoms and non-diatom uh, periphyton, uh, which is probably a good thing. We, it's, it's healthy to have competition like that. Um, we also know that there's a tremendous diversity in the diatom community and that we see trends in time that show seasonal patterns, um, which are correlated to water quality. Um, and we also see that there are trends in space that reflect water quality gradients. Um, and that's by seeing, you know, the more tolerant species farther downstream, the less tolerant or more selective species upstream where, you know, we have better water quality. So which really ties the two uh, measurements together. Um, I want to share with you some resources uh, that I find tremendously helpful. Uh, first is the Idaho DEQ, their website, all sorts of information on harmful algal blooms, as well as our total maximum daily loads. Uh, LowerBoiseWatershedCouncil.org. Uh, you can look up management uh, projects, what's actually being done and, and supported uh, to improve water quality in, in the Lower Boise River watershed. 
uh, diatoms.org for everything diatom. I hope that you got at least a little bit excited about them today. Uh, they're absolutely fascinating creatures. Um, and then also the Boise River Enhancement uh, Network at boiseriverenhancement.org. Um, get involved. Uh, be involved is to be part of the, sol part of the solution. Um, also AWRA, um, the Idaho chapter for events and information. And then lastly, I want to just want to point out that all of the data that we collect as part of this project uh, is open to the public and you can find that at usgs.gov. Um, here I have uh, a slide that to acknowledge uh, the sources that were used in the research for this presentation. And Tiny Sculpin and I would like to say thank you very much, not only for the opportunity to present today and for your attention, uh, but also for the continuing efforts to make the Lower Boise River a place that both he and I uh, want to be. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tyler. This is Liz Paul with the Boise River Enhancement Network. And um, we'll let uh, Tyler catch his breath. That was, that was awesome. That was a credible amount of stuff packed in. And uh, uh, get a little drink maybe. And then um, feel free to start typing some, uh, if you have some questions for him, um, type those in. I, I also want to extend thanks um, to the U.S. Geological Survey and the Science Center here in Boise that have just collected so much research over the decades on uh, water quality in the Boise River. Um, oh yes, people say you had impressive pronunciation skills. I thought you did as well. Um, and uh, I'll point out again that we do have our next program next Friday, Birds of the Boise River, River with Louisa Evers. And um, if you thought paraphyton was, and diatoms were exciting, then you might think birds are too big, but, uh, but birds are great too. And then uh, the week after that, on the 24th of April, we'll be having a presentation on uh, no-till farming uh, and improving soil health and how that grows more food, saves water, and produces a cleaner Boise River. I'm going to put up our last poll here real quick. And I don't see any questions coming in yet, but um, we can have Tyler answer some of the questions if they do start coming in and you guys can fill fill out the poll on what you thought about this program. It's still launching. So John McLean asked the question, um, examples of efforts to improve quality. I'm gonna let you answer that question, Tyler. Sure, yeah, so it, it kind of gets at um, the next comment, which asks if improvements might, might be due to uh, things like the Dixie Drain Project from a year, few years back, and, and the answer is yes, and that is a great example uh, of efforts to improve water quality. So what the, um, the, the Dixie Drain Project, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, I'm sure there are others on the call who can speak more uh, directly to this or better than I, but in general, what they do is they take water from the Dixie drain and put it through a series of settling basins um, and also uh, enc encourage the particulate phosphorus to settle out before returning flows back to Dixie drain um, and, and you know, end up returning water uh, to the Boise River that, that's cleaner than if that, uh, that filtration and uh, removal system were not in place. So that's one example. Um, additionally, uh, as Liz just mentioned, there's a presentation coming up on, on no-till farming. Uh, that's another uh, avenue for uh, projects to improve quality um, by planting, say, cover crops and not tilling the soil. That reduces the amount of soil erosion uh, and reduces the amount of uh, particulate phosphorus that can enter the, the lower Boise River. Uh, additionally, there are um, 
projects like converting from flood irrigation to center pivot irrigation where um, where less water ends up running off at least that's that's the, that's the theory um, and that that reduces uh, the load of nutrients to the river so those are, those are some examples of um, of efforts to improve quality and quality. And I should also mention that huge, huge capital investments by our cities and municipalities to upgrade their wastewater treatment plants. Okay, there's a question by Barry Bean. Great presentation. Did you evaluate? Do you evaluate trends in nitrophiles and so saprobity? Um, the answer to that question is no, not yet. Um, that is something that uh, that we're interested in doing. Um, so Barry, if you have good references for um, uh, nitrophilic traits by species um, and saprobity by species, I, I would love to see those. Um, and we could incorporate them into looking at trends for uh, how uh, various water quality parameters may be showing up in, uh, in the paraphytic environment. Okay, Rebecca Flock asked, can you give some examples of what happened in 2012? The total phosphorus graph did seem to dip then. That's a really good question, Rebecca, and I have to say, I don't know. Um, that was before my time uh, living in Boise and time with the USGS. Um, I, I honestly, I honestly don't don't know what happened, but I can look into it and get and get back to you. Chris Walser asked, "Are the, are you primarily using microscopy to identify diatom types, or are you using eDNA methods?" Uh, the answer to that is we're using microscopy. Uh, we contract with, uh, with a lab. Uh, that lab is EcoAnalyst. Uh, we send them our samples and they, uh, they put them under slides uh, to, identify, to identify the species present. Um, that said, there's some there are some really exciting developments for an eDNA lab um, right here in Boise uh, that's um, going to be built as uh, as part of development of the um, USGS campus here in town, so that could that could very well be a method to use in the future. But for right now, we're depending on uh, microscopy and the um, the skills of, of of those microscopists to um, to identify various species. Okay, Colin Glass, what can be done about the reservoirs holding and stopping minerals and nutrients from entering the rivers naturally? Well, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a big question. Um, what can be done about them? Well, so I, I would take a stab that intakes can be established at various depths within the feeding water bodies uh, in an attempt to profile the entire water column it to to pass a more natural signal of uh, of minerals and nutrients uh, downstream. So that that that's one approach. Of course, another is is dam breaching. That's not necessarily um, a very viable option for for our system because the reservoirs that we have are also so important for flood mitigation. Um, but if you uh, hear um, if you've been listening to the news about discussions of removing dams uh, along the Columbia River, uh, it's definitely something that's getting a lot of a, a lot of press, and and one of the reasons that why that uh, approach is is viewed as uh, beneficial is that it could restore uh, sediment, mineral, and uh, nutrient transport uh, to a more natural more natural regimes. Okay, Adam asks, uh, do diatoms con continuously float downstream or do they stay in one spot? Also, what's their lifespan? So diatoms that we're talking about here, um, they, they excrete a thing called mucilage, which allows them to stick to surfaces. 
So for the most part, uh, as long as they're living, they tend to, st they, they tend to not uh, drift uh, very much. Uh, they tend to be stuck to surfaces. Now there are diatoms that are um, pelagic or uh, planktonic where they, they, they um, sorry, pelagic, where they, um, where they, they do exist uh, up in the water column. And because of that, uh, they, they tend to drift more. Um, what's their lifespan? That's a, <laughs> generally speaking, they'll divide every one day to every seven days or so, depending on the, the species, the strain, and the water quality conditions. So they have relatively short uh, division times. <coughs> Excuse me. That being said, lifespan is a tricky thing to talk about when you're, when you're talking about cells dividing, because let's say that you, know, you divide one individual in half in one day, and then you divide them in half again the next day. Well, that first individual now you know, it has been broken up into quarters. So at what point do they no longer exist? That kind of gets into some ph philosophy. Um, but I think I think the most direct answer to your question is that they uh, they, they divide every one about every one day to every seven days. Okay, Colton asks, how does herbicide slash pesticide infiltration into rivers affect periphyton populations? Ooh, that that I don't know. Um, my, my guess is that they're probably uh, susceptible um, along a gradient, which is uh, which, which went into uh, that uh, classification from highly sensitive to highly tolerant. Um, my guess is that uh, the very the, the highly sensitive uh, species are probably not going to probably not going to uh, thrive in an environment with uh, herbicides and pesticides uh, being introduced to the system, whereas the highly tolerant ones probably uh, based on you know their cellular structure are able to say screen out those uh, the, the, what, what would be toxic compounds uh, for other members of the diatom um, and the paraphytic community. Um, I do know that there are herbicides that are specifically used to remove uh, periphyton, um, so ke chemical treatment that that tends to work, you know, and ba basically in the same way as a terrestrial herbicide. Um, so, I mean, the evidence would suggest that it's, um, that, that there are impacts, what the impacts are in the lower Boise River. I, I'm not sure that we, not sure we know that at this point. Okay, I think we've made it through all the questions that I saw. Thank you very, very much, Tyler. I wish I had one of those like auto applause machines and we could play all kinds of awesome applause for you. Um, we really appreciate your time today and all the effort you put into putting this presentation together and learning how to pronounce everything. And uh, I, for one, think paraphyton and diatoms are amazing. And when I go out there and instead of just thinking it's a green slimy rock, I'll have I'll have a whole different perspective. Oh, Rebecca asks implications into the Hell's Canyon complex. Uh, oh, and then another one, do you see succession in paraphyton community from early spring to late summer? I'm going to um, put myself back on mute, but let, I wanted to let everybody know that um, this was recorded and you'll be able to find that recording on our webpage and on our Facebook page as soon as I can get that. Okay. So uh, Chris asked, do you see succession in peri the periphyton community from early spring to late summer? Um, the answer to that question is, is generally speaking, yes. Um, and you've asked a question that will trigger me to move on to, um, to some additional slides here. Um, so this is looking at cell density. Uh, this is one of those horrific slides that was way too busy to talk about earlier. 
Um, this allows us to look at, as you move throughout, throughout the year, uh, how the composition tends to change uh, by site. So the dates are on the x-axis, right? And in this particular set of data, we have um, observations from November, February, August, October, February, and August. So to answer your question from early spring to late summer, I mean, I guess we would compare February to August. Um, and generally speaking, um, we, we do see shifts. Um, for example, at Parma, we tend to see a shift from uh, fewer or le less of, of the, al the green algae uh, and the blue-green algae uh, to more of that. Uh, we also see an increase uh, in, in this number of cells. Now, as far as like the community structure, so who's present, that doesn't tend to change a whole lot um, within um, with within the community, and we can look at that by looking at the uh, excuse me this um, you know, this relative density, and you can see that for the most part uh, for algae we're looking at pseudoanabaceae, uh, and for diatoms we're mostly looking at uh, bacillari bacilliariaceae uh, and some fragilariaceae. So some some shift, but we have not uh, mapped out uh, the complete. Um, species composition and, and how they change over time, but that is something that I think would be very interesting to, to, to look into further. Uh, Rebecca asks, can you speak to implications to Hell's Canyon complex? Yes, absolutely. So uh, total phosphorus uh, is limited in the lower Boise River, uh, specifically because because there were problems, or then there are problems, with harmful algal blooms cropping up in the Hell's Canyon complex. So what they do when, when you know, they have a condition like that, they look upstream to see who are the contributors of uh, nutrients to a given water body. So they started at Hell's Canyon, they looked upstream, and the lower Boise is indeed one of the contributors. Um, and so by kind of back calculating um, how much phosphorus the Hell's Canyon complex can assimilate without having harmful algal blooms, uh, they prescribed a concentration of phosphorus that's allowed uh, to leave the lower Boise River. And that's how we end up with our limit of 0 0.07 uh, milligrams per liter. And it's, um, it's all tied back into the Hell's Canyon complex. And so as we continue to see improvements in water quality uh, in the lower Boise River, we should also expect, you know, over time that we'll see that, that those improvements will propagate downstream. So we're, in a way, paying it forward. We're not only cleaning up our own uh, environment and watershed that, that we live in, but we're also helping to improve uh, d downstream water users. Um, and, you know, anybody who wants to go camp along the shores of, uh, say, Brownlee Reservoir. all figured out. Excellent, excellent, uh, very, very comprehensive. Uh, Tyler, Tyler King from the U.S. Geological Survey here in Boise, and uh, thank you so much to everybody who attended. I will uh, let Tyler look at all the nice complimentary remarks in the chat, and then I'll be ending the meeting. Again, thanks from Lower Boise Watershed Council, the Idaho chapter of the AWRA, and the Boise River Enhancement Network. We really appreciate your attention today. And thanks to Adam for being the co-host as well. <laughs>